Hi Texans, this is Kira Stetford. I'm the Assistant Director for Student Counseling Services, and I'm going to talk to you today about the role of power in violence. This is going to be a short um, overview. It's gonna feel kind of fast and furious, and it is because this is gonna be brief and just kind of scratch the surface, but um, you can always learn more if you're interested. So let's go ahead and dive in. So we're gonna to talk today about the role of power in violence. And this is being recorded in April. It's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. However, this dynamic of power plays an important role in all of the forms of violence that we work very hard to prevent on this campus and in our community. Sexual violence in all of its forms, domestic dating violence, sometimes called intimate partner violence, as well as stalking. So in a healthy relationship or in healthy interactions, power is basically equal. And that's not necessarily because no differences exist between two people, but because if one person does have more power, they don't use it. And they certainly don't exploit it in order to harm their partner. And in fact, they may go out of their way to ensure that the other person feels safe and is empowered in that relationship or in that interaction. When it comes to violence, however, there is almost always an imbalance of power. And that can look very different from situation to situation. And there are lots of things that can create that imbalance, but it's usually there if you look at the details of the situation and the dynamics of the people involved. So again, lots of things can create that imbalance. This is not a complete list. It's just to get you thinking and give you some ideas. Um, importantly, we need to understand that we all have more power in some relationships. We have less in others. Many of the things that can create a power imbalance are things that we don't have any control over. The fact that power imbalances exist isn't a problem in and of itself. The problem is when someone misuses that. So looking at this list, a couple of these, age and size, are pretty straightforward. And those are things that are relatively easy to identify from the outside looking in. A person who is older, especially if there's a significant age gap, certainly has an advantage over a younger person. A physically larger person could certainly more easily intimidate a smaller person than a person of a similar size or who's larger. However, some of these things maybe aren't quite so obvious or they're things we don't always think about um, right off the bat when we hear about um, harm occurring. So when we think about social status, a person who is a newcomer to a community or to an industry is most certainly not on a level playing field compared to somebody who has been in that industry or in that community for a long period of time who is very well known, well liked, well connected, may have very powerful and influential friends within, again, this community or this industry. Um, there's a stark difference between people who are at opposite ends of that spectrum. If a person identifies as something other than heterosexual and not everyone in their life knows that, they feel the need to keep that secret for some reason, possibly for their safety. If someone in their circle knows that secret, that could be exploited and that certainly could be problematic um, for the person that is being exploited. That could put them in very real danger if they were outed without their own, without their consent. And financial st stability, this can certainly create differences when we talk about any of these forms of violence, but we see this frequently when we're thinking about domestic violence or intimate partner violence, where one partner maybe controls all of the finances or has access to finances that the other partner doesn't. Um, if there is dependency, one partner is very dependent on the other person um, for their home, for food, shelter, um, what money they do have, that is most definitely a power imbalance. And again, in thinking kind of specifically about relationships, sometimes from the outside looking in, it may look like a family is very stable. But again, if one person has all of the control and they have access to all the accounts and have alerts set up on all of those accounts, the other person, the victim in that situation may not be able to withdraw any money or to open a line of credit without 
their abuser immediately knowing about it and facing the consequences that could come with that. And differences in level of sobriety or in intoxication. This is a good opportunity to address this intersection of violence and substance use because sometimes we're kind of weird as a society when this comes up and we don't always um, see this accurately or respond well when we hear about somebody being harmed and we find out alcohol is involved in any way. So in the counseling center, we often will say alcohol plays a couple of roles when we think about sexual assault and especially in a social setting or a party scenario. It provides the weapon for the person who is willing to commit that kind of harm to incapacitate their target, which obviously creates a power imbalance. And it also provides the camouflage for that assault to occur if the other people in that environment haven't had training and haven't talked about some of these issues and maybe aren't aware of some of the red flags earlier in the evening leading up to that possible assault. Um, we also will often say from this office that there are reasonable consequences for having too much to drink or for getting high for that matter. Um, if you drink or you get high and you get behind the wheel of a car and try to drive and you get arrested, that's reasonable um, because you chose to get behind the wheel of the car and drive. Um, if I drink too much and I act like a jerk and my friends are angry with me the next day, that's reasonable. There's no reality in which rape is a reasonable consequence of intoxication. So there have been a lot of examples in the news over the last few years about these imbalances of power and people preying on people who have had less power and causing lots of harm to lots of people over long periods of time. And so this is just to kind of get you thinking, can you think back to some of those stories and just having talked about this and learned just a little bit about this one dynamic, help you see those maybe through a slightly different lens or maybe understand those situations in a little bit of a different way than you did before. Finally, people who cause harm or who are willing to cause harm, they don't pick on people who have more power. If I'm the kind of person who would harass another person, I'm not gonna go harass my boss because my boss would just fire me. I'm gonna pick someone who can't so easily put me in my place. That's how this works. And so when we hear about somebody being harmed, we often don't want to believe that people are capable of causing this kind of harm. We don't want to believe the world works like that. And so sometimes we hear about violence occurring and we don't always respond very well to that. That's one of the reasons that we offer trainings like this and that we pick apart some of these dynamics and look a little more closely at some of them. So when you hear those stories, whether somebody comes to you and tells you they've been hurt or you read about something in the news, when somebody uses their power to hurt another person, to prey on another person who doesn't have as much power, that is not an accident, that is not a misunderstanding, that's not miscommunication. When we think about that example of a couple where one person controls all the finances and then maybe we hear about um, violence having happened between that couple, that's not miscommunication. That is abusive. And at the end of the day, that behavior, looking for people who are weaker and preying on that, that's predatory. And if we are going to be part of the solution, we need to understand these dynamics so that when we hear these things, we respond better in a more helpful way as friends and family members and community members. And we hold people who do commit harm accountable for that harm. So what do we do with this? Here are a few ideas to get you started. The solution to violence always starts with ourselves and being diligent about paying attention to ourselves. So pay attention to in your relationships when you have power and how you use that and commit to creating equality in your relationships. And you may already be doing a beautiful job of that and that's great. But it's important if we really are committed to this that we're always kind of checking our own behavior and um, looking at ourselves first. And then talk about this. Um, like I'm doing this training today in some way, whether it's on your social media or in conversation, talk about this topic, point out examples, demystify it for other people so that 
they understand this better. And again, when someone comes to us needing support, we can be supportive and help them get to the right places and to the right people to get the help that they need and help them on their path to healing. So speaking of, here is a reminder about your campus resources. And if you ever need support or you've got a friend who needs support and you're not really sure where to start, please start with us in Student Counseling Services. We are a confidential resource. So we can talk with you about what's available and what your options are and what is good and right for you and help you figure out what your next steps are and support you in taking those next steps. Certainly you have support in other offices on campus as well in Health Services, our University Police Department and our Campus Title IX Coordinator. So thanks for listening and and take care of each other.